Solution Approach for Analyzing Transmission Lines. In this video, we're just going to take a very high level look at how we are going to analyze a transmission line, what differential equations will solve, and then what we'll do with the answer in order to calculate things like distributed impedance, or sorry, distributed inductance, distributed capacitance, and characteristic impedance. So this all has to start with Maxwell's equations. These are the equations that describe all of classical electrodynamics. And we can think of Maxwell's equations as what causes fields and how they behave. Interestingly, Maxwell's equations don't tell us how the fields interact with matter. If you'll notice, you're looking at Maxwell's equations, um, there's no material properties here, which is the permittivity and the permeability. So in fact, Maxwell's equations is missing a little bit of information. That information comes from the constitutive relations. And so that's where the electric permittivity and the magnetic permeability enter into this. So Maxwell's equations is more like what causes fields, how they induce each other. And the constitutive relations is talking about how the fields interact with matter. So this is where we have to start if we're going to analyze anything electromagnetic. A little bit more information about the physical constants. I don't want to go too deep into the electromagnetic theory. I have other classes that dive into that. But we can think of the permittivity as how much the electric fields interact with a medium. A little bit more rigorously, it's a measure of how well a material stores electric energy. And I don't want to get too much into that. Just think of it as a constant telling us how much the fields interact with the matter. So the permittivity, we can write as the product of two things. We can write it as the free space permittivity times the relative permittivity. And the permittivity is an ugly number, like 4.56 times 10 to the minus 12. And so what we do is we lump the ugly number into the free space permittivity. So in outer space, vacuum has this permittivity, which is 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. And you might remember farads, that's how we measure capacitance, which stores electric energy. So the fact that permittivity is a measure of how well a medium stores electric energy, that's consistent. Anyway, all of the ugliness being absorbed into this free space permittivity lets this relative permittivity term be very, very easy to work with. Vacuum has a relative permittivity of one. Plastics, those types of things have permittivity, relative permittivity around 2.5. Ceramics can be almost anything, uh, 10, 20, or, or even higher. So we tend to talk about things really just in terms of the relative permittivity, also called the dielectric constant. Or sometimes people say, oh, I have a K of 3.0. And what they're saying is that has a relative permittivity of 3.0. Even me, when I'm being lazy, I'll say, hey, what's the permittivity? And somebody will say 4.4. Really, they meant the relative permittivity. We have to multiply by this ugly constant, which has 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. So this relative permittivity has no units. Its lowest value is 1, and it can go up. I don't know if there is a maximum value. Uh, I know there's some over certain frequency ranges. It could be in the tens of thousands, maybe even higher. I don't know if there is a fundamental limit to that. We can do the same thing for the magnetic response of a material. This is called the permeability, and it's a measure of how much the magnetic fields interact with a medium. A bit more rigorously, we would say it's a measure of how well a medium stores magnetic energy. We also write this as the product of the free space permeability times the relative permeability. Much more rare that we talk about the relative permeability, and that's because most materials don't really have any kind of magnetic response, and this relative permeability is just one. But like the relative permittivity, lowest value is one, and as far as I know, there is no upper limit. For what we're doing, simulating transmission lines, we'll talk almost exclusively through this relative permittivity, this dielectric constant. Now from these, 1 divided by the square root of the relative permeability times relative permittivity, this gives us the speed of light. And this is an exact number because we're, we're basing meters and seconds on this now. So that's an exact number, and that is the speed of light. 
to analyze our transmission line a bit more easily. Uh, so we're not going to do a rigorous analysis of a transmission line. Uh, that is talked more about in the computational electromagnetics class. We're going to do something a bit easier, but the simulation, the model we're going to develop actually generates really good answers. We use this all the time, even though we have the more rigorous tools because it's just so simple and works so well. We're going to make an electrostatics approximation, meaning the field will not be changing with time. Now, even though we're analyzing a high frequency transmission line, almost always that transmission line is incredibly small compared to the wavelength of the frequency that it's carrying. And so the wave nature is essentially negligible. And so we can treat this somewhat accurately as an electrostatic approximation, but make no mistake, we are making an approximation and the simulation we're coming up with won't be able to handle loss. So we will be analyzing lossless transmission lines, which is still really good. Most transmission lines have pretty low loss and the transmission lines are only propagating signals, you know, a few inches over a circuit board. Now, if we want to analyze transmission lines that carry signals for many kilometers, yeah, I think we need to account for loss in that sort of a case. But for us, we want to design circuits or something like that. An electrostatic approximation really is a good approximation to make. So we're going to set the time derivative equal to zero in Maxwell's equations. And when we do that, these terms cancel. And we end up with a much simplified version of Maxwell's equations. Now, we would like to not work with vector quantities. We would like to solve a differential equation in terms of a scalar quantity. So instead of working with the electric field, it's going to be possible to work with the electric potential. These are not describing two things. It's one physical phenomenon that we're able to describe two different mathematical ways. Here's kind of how that works. So in Maxwell's equations, when we set the time derivatives equal to zero, we had an equation and it's called Faraday's law and it reduced to this. And the operation on the left you might recognize as the curl. So this is calculating the tendency of the electric field to circulate around some axis. And for electrostatics, we're saying that's zero. So the electric field can't rotate, can't spin in circles. So the electric field has to form essentially straight lines. Yeah, it can curve a little bit, but it's not gonna rotate about any kind of axis. From vector calculus, we have an identity saying that the curl of the gradient of some scalar function is always zero. So no matter what that scalar function is, the curl of the gradient of that scalar function is always zero. And we can prove that mathematically. Well, now we go up here and we see that we do have the curl of something equals zero. That must mean we should be able to express the electric field in terms of some scalar quantity. And that's exactly what we do. We define the electric field to be the minus gradient of the electric potential. The important thing is the gradient of the electric potential. The minus sign in there is just done for convenience to enforce our sign convention where the electric field will point itself from higher potential to lower potential. So think of electric fields extending from the plus side of a battery to the negative side of a battery. So remember this, um, electric field, negative gradient of the electric potential, and we measure this electric potential in volts. So to analyze our transmission line, we're going to need a differential equation. And ultimately what we want to do is come up with an equation so that we can calculate the electric potential in the vicinity of our transmission line. So, we're looking in the dielectric away from the metal so we don't have any charges. So in Maxwell's divergence equation, also Gauss's law, this would be called, we can set that charge equal to zero because we're analyzing the fields away from where there would be charges. We had this constitutive relation where D equals epsilon times E, where epsilon was the free space permittivity. I'm sorry, just the permittivity, not the free space permittivity, the permittivity. So we can take D and replace it with epsilon E. Now notice I've written just the relative permittivity here. Remember that we have the permittivity, which is what we had up here, 
equals the product of two things, our free space permittivity, which is a constant, and then the dielectric constant, which could change with position if we change our materials around the transmission line. So this uh, del dot, this is a divergence calculation. This has spatial derivatives in it. Well, this epsilon naught is a constant. It can come to the outside, and then we can divide both sides of the equation by epsilon naught, and zero divided by epsilon naught is a zero. So we're really just left with the free space permittivity or the dielectric constant. This can be a function of position, so we're not free to bring it to the outside. So that's as far as we can bring this equation. We also know that the electric field is the negative gradient of the electric potential. So we can now take this expression and put it in for the electric field to eliminate the electric field. And we end up here. And we might ask, what about the minus sign? Well, that's a constant. And that can come to the outside. We multiply both sides by negative one, and we end up here. This is called the inhomogeneous Laplace's equation. That's the equation we will solve to calculate the electric potential around the transmission line. Now, once we know that, we can just calculate the negative and gradient to get the electric field intensity. We can then multiply by the permittivity to get the electric flux density. So once we know this electric potential, we really know everything about the line. We have to process that, do some more calculations, but the, the hardcore finite difference analysis that we're working up to will be over with. It'll turn out we will also need the homogeneous Laplace's equation. We're going to have to analyze the transmission line in the absence of any kind of permittivity. So think of just filling with air. Well, if this permittivity becomes a constant, we can now bring it to the outside. We can then divide both sides by the dielectric constant. We end up here, and del dot the gradient, it turns out, is called the Laplacian, and we can just write it this way. So solving the Laplacian, that is called the homogeneous Laplace's equation, and it'll make sense, hopefully, why we're doing that in a little bit. Okay, so we've solved this differential equation. We've calculated the, the uh, electric potential. From that, we've calculated the electric field E, the electric field intensity, and also the electric flux density D. Well, it turns out one half times D dot E, that's the energy density. And so if we integrate that energy density over the entire cross section of the transmission line, a way far outside the transmission line to encompass all of the fields, and we add up all that energy density, we can calculate the total energy stored in that transmission line. I guess think of it like a capacitor. It's got these fields and we add up the energy in all of the fields and get total energy stored in that capacitor. From circuit theory, we have another equation. C times the voltage stored in the capacitor squared divided by two, that is also another way to get total energy stored in that capacitor. Well, comparing these two equations, we can set this integral equal to CV naught squared over two, we can set those equal and then solve for C. Now we have an expression to calculate the capacitance by adding up all of the fields, we're integrating all the fields. Oh yes, and we divide by one over the voltage of the line squared. Now we might ask those fields in principle can extend out to infinity. And so, you know, we can't create a grid in our simulation that extends out to infinity. We'll just cover enough of it so that we have, you know, 99% of the energy. And it turns out it's pretty well confined. So it's not too unreasonable to do that. The other thing we're going to do, we're going to apply one volt across our transmission line. So if this V naught is just one, then one squared is one, one divided by one is one, and this whole term drops off. Now, if for some reason you wanted to apply two volts or three volts or something else, we'd have to retain this term. But in our analysis, we're going to drop that and just retain the integration. But don't forget that that technically is there. We are just going to apply one volt across our line. So. We calculated capacitance, but since that's just the cross section of the line, we've actually calculated distributed capacitance and the units would be farads per meter. And that's one of the parameters of the transmission line. The next thing we'll need to calculate is the distributed inductance. So inductance is the tendency to store magnetic energy. 
So one might think we'd have to go back to Maxwell's equations and analyze the magnetic equations, and that's absolutely possible to do that. But there's a neat little trick that we can do where we can get the distributed inductance from the distributed capacitance. And in the electrostatic approximation, it'll turn out that the velocity of a wave in the medium surrounding the line would match exactly the velocity of a signal on the line. So it's sort of a, a wave in a medium, electromagnetic wave in a medium, matches the same velocity as a signal on the line. Well, we have a nice equation for velocity of a signal on a line. It's one over square root of time, one over square root of L times C, where L is the distributed inductance of the line and C is the distributed capacitance. And the velocity of a wave is one divided by the permeability times the permittivity. And the little h there, That'll make sense in a second. These are not the values that would actually be surrounding the line. Uh, follow with me for a second. Okay, so we will then solve this for L times C. And sorry, then solve for L, and now we're, we end up here. So this is an equation where we can calculate the distributed inductance from the distributed capacitance. But let's think about this. The distributed inductance is storing magnetic energy. It should not make any difference what the dielectric is around the line. However, if we're calculating the distributed inductance from the distributed capacitance, it would, and that does not make sense. And so it turns out what we're going to have to do is do two simulations, one of the line with the dielectric and all that, and we get the true distributed capacitance, then we're going to do a second one and remove all of the dielectrics, and we'll just fill it with air. It'll turn out we could actually fill it with whatever medium we want to, but it makes most sense for air. So we're doing a, an analysis now where the dielectric is completely homogeneous, and that's what these parameters represent, that homogeneous medium that we choose. And if we choose air, then the relative permeability and relative permittivity, these will both just be one. So... It comes from a second analysis. And so the way we'll write that is we strip away all the dielectrics, we have just air, and the distributed capacitance we get from that, we will call the homogeneous capacitance. So that's not the true distributed capacitance of the line because we stripped away the dielectric. But from that, we can calculate the true distributed inductance. And that's how we'll get the distributed inductance. Once we have the distributed inductance and the distributed capacitance, now we can calculate the all-important characteristic impedance. That's just the square root of L divided by C. And what you see in a previous lecture is it doesn't really matter whether the impedance is high or low. It's more when the impedance changes. And so knowing what the impedance is is critical for when we're designing transmission lines. The velocity of the signal on a line, we already know, is 1 over the square root of L times C. And another really important parameter is the effective dielectric constant. So we have the fields interacting with the metals, it's interacting with potentially inhomogeneous dielectrics, maybe air, maybe some dielectric, maybe something else. And so what medium would we have to replace everything with so that the signal would travel at that same speed? And so we call that the effective permittivity can think of it as an average permittivity, but it's more of a weighted average, weighted where the energy of the field is in the dielectric. So, but yeah, you can think of it as, a, as an average. And that's the speed of light squared times L times C. And so these are two really important design parameters when we're working with transmission lines. So we have this two-step modeling approach. Let's say we have this very strange coax. So we have this outer conductor I'm showing in blue. We have a center conductor I'm showing in red. And the reason I'm calling it a strange coax is we have this dielectric fill that I'm showing in green and yellow, but it's split. So there's actually two different permittivities here. Uh, why would anybody actually want to do that? Well, it would just be a cruel professor to make a neat example problem, I guess. So let's say we want to analyze that. Well, first thing we'd want to do is strip away all of the dielectrics and build a transmission line onto a grid that has absolutely no dielectrics anywhere. From that, we would get a distributed capacitance for this homogeneous case. 
That is not the true distributed capacitance, but from that, we do calculate the true distributed inductance. We do everything all over again. However, now we build our two dielectrics into the grid from which we do get our true distributed capacitance. Now that we have the true distributed inductance and the true distributed capacitance, we can calculate everything else. So here's the flow of how things will go. And what you'll see is we're going to do a lot of everything twice. Like any program, we're going to initialize it, we're going to set up our grid, and then we, we enter the code proper. And so first thing we'll do is we'll build our transmission line onto the grid. So, and that will include building our dielectrics and the metals. And we're going to have to do this twice, once for this homogeneous line and once for the inhomogeneous line. And the inhomogeneous line is, I guess, the actual line that we're trying to simulate. The homogeneous one is just sort of that one that we get the distributed inductance from, where the dielectric shouldn't enter into this. All right, so we have two descriptions of a transmission line. From there, for the homogeneous one, this is why we had to derive the homogeneous Laplace's equation. So that's a much easier equation to solve than this, the inhomogeneous Laplace's equation. So we solved the homogeneous Laplace's equation for the homogeneous electric potential, and we solved the inhomogeneous Laplace's equation for the inhomogeneous electric potential. So the analysis is sort of done. That's really the hard part. Once we have the electric potential, now we can calculate the electric fields. So we'll calculate the homogeneous E and D from the homogeneous electric potential. And so we do it in a two-step process. The negative gradient gives us the electric field E, then we multiply by the permittivity, and that gives us the electric flux density D. And we do that same thing again for the actual electric potential or the inhomogeneous electric potential. From there, we calculate our distributed capacitance. Now, you might notice one little funny thing here. I'm writing this constitutive relation as D equals the relative permittivity times the electric field, but shouldn't there have been a free space permittivity? Yes, there should have been. But what I did for convenience is I removed the parameter epsilon naught from this step and I brought it over to here. And so now I actually have two equations that are incorrect, but the reason I do that is I like to have all of the numbers in my model be as close to the value one as possible. And so by having this epsilon naught here, uh, now I'm suddenly carrying crazy units. So I don't wanna do that to the very last possible step, which is when we calculated the distributed capacitance. So that's why I've done that. I've moved the epsilon naught over to the capacitance equation. And I did that for both the homogeneous and the inhomogeneous case. Now, for the inhomogeneous case, this is the true distributed capacitance of the line. For the homogeneous case, that is not the true distributed capacitance of the line. That would only be the true distributed capacitance of the line is if the line had no dielectrics at all. But from this, we calculate the actual true distributed inductance. You'll notice I included a relative permeability, and that's there just in case this does happen to have a medium that has a magnetic response, will have the ability to fill this whole thing with the relative permeability that wouldn't be one. But this approach wouldn't let you have an inhomogeneous relative permeability. So we would actually have to go back to Maxwell's equations and analyze the magnetic case. But I know of hardly any transmission lines, almost none. Um, in fact, I might even be able to say none that actually have magnetic materials in them. They're, was some obscure things I worked on in one of my previous jobs that did that, but that was a very special application. Okay, so we now have the distributed inductance and the distributed capacitance. We can bring those together and calculate the characteristic impedance, the phase constant, and the effective permittivity. And in a way, these two things are telling us the same information. In transmission line designs, it tends to be the characteristic impedance and this phase constant. Those are the two big ones that tell us everything we need to know about the line in order to produce designs. So that's how we will analyze things. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video.
I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.